Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 37 of Ancient Office Hours. This week's guest is Dr. Jeremy Swist, a classics professor at Brandeis University. I was lucky enough to first connect with Jeremy via classics Twitter last year, and as I followed his work, I became more and more fascinated by his research on heavy metal in classical reception studies. While I'm not really a fan of metal music, I'm still a huge music listener, so I thought it would be really fun to have him on the podcast to talk about the intersection of two things I love, music and the ancient world. Our wide-ranging discussion touched on a few things, including why classicists only tend to be on Twitter, how he turned his love of metal music into a career in classics, and whether the age of streaming will help produce more music literature and art that will leave a lasting legacy. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Thank you so much for joining me this morning. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to speaking with you for a while, and I want to jump right on in and ask you, how did you come to classics? How did you discover it? And how did you decide you just love this thing? Well, first off, thanks for having me on. It's quite an honor. So this is a question where I could go very far back in time or or not. I grew up in Boston. My parents were in the choir and my father played the pipe organ for St. Paul Church in Harvard Square and it was a Catholic church. It didn't do like full-blown Tridentine Latin acids, but a lot of the kind of sung parts of the liturgy uh, they did at least part of the time in Latin. So that was my first exposure to this language through this kind of cool sounding music. Uh, and I associated with, you know, you know, my father's a pipe organist, I always like pipe organ music. So it was just a cool things for me, um, but I didn't know what the words meant. Uh, but eventually, as I kind of grew up, I started, little things started getting me into the ancient world. Probably the, the biggest thing was probably the computer game Age of Empires in the mid 90s. I was really into that and I played the, you know, expansions and, and the sequels. Uh, but the original was always dear to my heart. And, you know, the theme music goes through my head and all the silly nonsense words that you know the, the villagers say so that that was my kind of my first exposure to ancient history so when I learned about it in school I you know I tended to pay special attention uh, because of that I had already been taking like French throughout middle school as sort of my kind of the language I was taking but uh, when it came time to get into high school I was thinking about maybe I, I like this language thing maybe I'll pick up another language the language I really wanted to pick up at the time was was German the problem was that they were uh, my high school, there were some budget put- cuts going on and it was possible that German would not be offered because, you know, just low enrollment and stuff. And so I had to think of a backup. And my mother, who got her degree in linguistics from the University of Buffalo, said, why don't you take Latin? And I remember this eighth grader saying, why would I do that? <laughs> what 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 is Latin for? I had just, I mean, I knew I, I sang it in church, but I didn't really think of it beyond that. And so, well, I signed it up as a backup and, you know, the rest is history. I got into a Latin class and taking Latin in high school concurrently with French, I came to like Latin a lot better in terms of how I was, the methods that I was using to learn it, uh, as well as just the subject matter of talking about ancient history and poetry uh, and kind of following along these kind of made up Roman families in our textbooks. And it just, it seemed this kind of world into a completely different culture than today. And I think I'm just like that in general, where I like to study things that kind of uh, transport me out of the present. So that's why I really like sci-fi and like period dramas. And so like studying this stuff, you know, has that effect for me too. I was growing up in Boston, surrounded by, you know, American history, Revolutionary War stuff, which, you know, is very interesting, but it just became so familiar to me that I really wanted to, I wanted something more exotic. Um, And so I think that's another reason I sort of got an ancient history. 
I had already wanted to be a teacher at that point. I was inspired by a rather eccentric seventh grade geography teacher named Mr. Lalakata, who was <laughs> did a lot of very strange things in the classroom and including like standing up on a desk and like peering through like, you know, one of those false ceilings with the styrofoam or whatever that material is and talking to his imaginary friend, Henry, I think. He basically inspired me to teach her because it's like, wow, somebody can like stand up in front of a class and be a complete weirdo and totally be themselves and get paid for it. And it's like, so I was like, great, it sounds good to me. So I went into college at the University of Maine as a secondary ed major with a concentration in Latin. I had also enrolled in the honors program there, which uh, was essentially a great book sequence over four semesters. And the first semester of that sequence was essentially the ancient stuff. We started with the Iliad and we read Plato's Symposium. We read Aristotle's Politics. I think we ended that semester with Virgil's Aeneid. We also read Apuleius, uh, Golden Ass in the, in the following semester. It was really my first encounter, at least in full with those texts. I had small discussion groups uh, to talk about them. Them, and we had various experts come in once a week to like give a lecture on, you know, the book of the week. You know, I was kind of awash in all of these, you know, new ideas that and thinking about this literature and in ways I've, you know, never thought before. At one point, I, my sophomore year, I had dropped the secondary ed major, picked up both a Latin major and a history major. And I decided I wanted to be an ancient historian, basically my sophomore year. By the time I kind of was starting to get out of college and I was applying to grad schools, I applied to all ancient history programs and I didn't get into any of them. And so I thought to myself, hmm, uh, I guess I'll, uh, you know, try again next year. And I adjuncted uh, teaching Greek in that interim period because the classicist at UMaine, and my mentor, Tina Passman, was very generous in giving me that opportunity. And then I found I really enjoyed teaching Greek and Latin. And so I decided, you know, maybe, maybe I could also apply to some classics programs as well, because I, you know, I like the literature just as much as the history. Well, I uh, got into all of the classics programs I applied to, well, two of them total, and I didn't get into the ancient history programs. And then there was one like hybrid program that was both that I got waitlisted for. And I think that tells you kind of mathematically where I was meant to be. And so I went to the University of Iowa for, for graduate school. The, the rest is history. As they say, <laughs> famous words. One of the reasons I love talking to people and hearing about their entrance as it were to classics is because it's always so different it really drives home the point that no two paths are the same and i was noticing as you were talking about your amazing seventh grade teacher the parallels because my amazing sixth grade history teacher was this wonderful, gregarious, very fun. I don't really know how to explain her in, in more wonderful terms, but this wonderful lady, essentially. And she also was kind of a weirdo, but in the best possible way, because she would come in and she was the only teacher in the whole school who was like, I want everyone tomorrow wearing bed sheets. And she's like, you are going to pick an ancient name. And God damn it, I'm going to call you by these names. She's like, don't you use your name. Uh-uh. And we're like, oh, okay. What, what, what is this? And, and she was just like, this table, you, you're Athens. You, you're Sparta. Now you have to hate each other because it's historically correct. And I was like, what? Wait, no. And then it was like, my good friend was at the Sparta table. And I was like, wait, I don't want to like hate you. And she was just like, well, you, you got to fake it when you're in the class. Okay. And I was like, okay, sure. Fine. What? It's definitely thanks to wonderful teachers who are just like, forcing you to do what seems to be like kind of random things. And then it just, it turns out to be this lifelong passion. Although for me, it wasn't classics. As a lot of my listeners know, it was Egyptology. It was definitely that Egypt unit, but you know, the reality set in and through high school, I was like, okay, well, that's not going to be a, a thing for me. So never mind. We're going to go the classics route. Yeah. I love hearing about great teachers. I want to spotlight them and give them all the respect they're due. Cause I feel like a lot of people kind of gloss over early teachers and early experiences and just say, well, you know, I wasn't old enough. They just did a thing. And then I found myself in college or whatever. And to spotlight people who don't really get the credit a lot of times and makes makes me and makes them feel really good I would hope so now that you've you found your way into classics and then you decided hey you loved it and you wanted to stay there but was there any point where you kind of had self-doubt set in where it was like you know is this really realistic am I gonna make money am I gonna struggle forever because I think a lot of people really struggle with I don't know if this is like okay I can maybe if I get lucky I get a job but you know I'm gonna be poor forever yeah, uh, that's definitely conversations I've had with uh, many people who kind of helped me along the way, you know, as as I was kind of getting toward the end of grad school, uh, including, you know, my 
my parents and, you know, my father, I love him very much and we're very similar people, but his career was in technology. He went to MIT and was in the software industry. And so like he, he wanted, you know, obviously just me to be able to make a living and support myself. He was certainly had a lot of concerns as I was going into this field that I'd be able to live a kind of comfortable living that he, you know, was able to provide for me uh, as a father. You know, I, I appreciate those concerns because it's always good to have people kind of, uh, even if, you know, you're really determined to, to go a certain way, you know, to have some people say, you know, uh, reflect on this a little bit more before you take any more steps. And so, so that was good. And so I think, yeah, he's very supportive as, as is my mother, who's the one who kind of got this whole ball rolling by making me take Latin. So that's good. The job market in this field is, is hell and it gets worse every year. And so, you know, there's definitely a lot of those feelings of, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, imposter syndrome, thinking about, oh, what's going to happen if I kind of strike out on the market and just kind of staring to avoid. That's essentially what happened during the pandemic. You know, I was let go from an academic job due to just the, the cuts that affected everyone. And I was, and that kind of sent me into really staring into the abyss, thinking that there was no future here. You know, I think a lot of us were, you know, pretty dark places uh, a year ago. The people who kind of had been supporting me a lot along the way kind of reached out, reminded me that, you know, I, not to give up hope, there, there's something out there. And I managed to kind of climb my way back, back into business. Thankfully, those, those relationships came through for me again. So I'm really appreciative of that. And I try my best to, you know, be that person for, for other people people, you know, who are possibly, you know, struggling or just less privileged or just, you know, not as well networked to kind of give them a leg up, give them a platform, amplify their voices and hopefully, you know, and help them kind of work their way through this mostly thankless system, right? <laughs> yeah. And I know, I, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking just the other day that we are more connected than ever, which should theoretically make things easier to find opportunities. But at the same time, it makes it harder because since everyone is able to be out there, things are just much more competitive because you you now know, oh, wait, there's like actually so many more people who all want one thing from a very small stable of opportunity. I would say young aspiring either ancient historians or classicists who kind of are looking at this terrible job market and, and sort of this what we would sort of refer to as this almost ivory tower like institution that we just see as the academy or whatever we want to call it, which is so historically hard to get into. To. How can we best start using these resources and what can we use? Because I know right now the phenomenon that is classics Twitter. It wasn't until honestly after I graduated that I discovered that there are actually a lot of classes on Twitter. That's also while it connects all of us. I've had a lot of discussions with people that say, but that's the only place that classes really gather online. And that's really unhelpful because there's so many people who are like, I don't want Twitter. It's toxic. It creates more problems than it helps. So like, how do we as classicists really break that sort of mold of we are on this one platform because we're trying to get out there, but also it's like the most restrictive because it's the one that people don't want to be on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely don't fault anyone for, uh, you know, not wanting to get onto the <laughs> this the avian hell site as i've been calling it lately so i think i'm identifying a few kind of positive directions that things are hopefully you know continuing to go you know there's no I don't like to say there's silver linings to the pandemic because, you know, I don't think it was all worth it. The fact of the matter is that accessibility to conferences like the AISS and CAMLIS and others is something that I think is starting to move forward since so AISS made the conference that's going to happen in January next year, fully hybrid for both presenters and attendees, which I think is a great way of making sure that people who can't fly to San Francisco and stay in the fancy Hilton and eat all the expensive food in town can't afford to do that or just don't have the time to because, you know, they are perhaps disabled or caring for family or have other obligations have to work. So making more conferences online or hybrid, I think should be, should be normal now, just like hybrid should be the bare minimum, you know, we can still meet in person. There's definitely benefits to that, but having that accessibility is, I think, a huge step toward creating those kind of spaces where classes, ancient historians, but also people outside the disciplines can join in on these conversations uh, to the mutual benefit of all involved. Yeah, I think that conferences are definitely the single biggest opportunity to really network and get your name out there, get your research out there, or even your interests. And I know there are 
some programs out there that are designed at, at helping cut costs. I know Project Visiting Scholar is one of them. I think it's a great idea for those who are not aware of what that is. It's basically kind of like Airbnb, but for the specific purpose of going to academic conferences where you are connected on the site and then you're matched with someone who lives in a host city and then you just go, hey, do you have a spare room or a couch? Can I crash there? It's it's a wonderful way to connect you. But also if you have friends, you can tell them to get on and say, hey, would you mind hosting? So it's a really great idea. And I think we need more of that. I just wish there were more. But then you get into like, well, safety concerns and other things, because sometimes you're like, OK, well, safety first. Let's not be sketchy. But I think those are very positive steps forward. I'm not aware of many scholars who are on like Facebook, like public public facing Facebooks, not very active. And some of the other platforms, I I think a lot of scholars kind of flee to academia.edu and other places other than that avian hell space that we call Twitter. Is there another good platform right now? any kind of social media that's not specifically like an initiative like making conferences accessible that we should be or maybe it's not that we should be there but is it worth going someplace to try to also you know spread our positive messages and change this image and like you know what should we be doing Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and now TikTok, I think a lot of classicist ancient historians and other scholars have been utilizing you know all of those you know popular platforms, you know, to the advantage of uh, disseminating, you know, their work and kind of presenting to the public, you know, what we do and kind of, again, being those mediators between, you know, this area of knowledge and this area of history and culture and, you know, the public who would otherwise, you know, perhaps only know the ancient world through the most popular things like, you know, movies, heavy metal music, which is kind of where I kind of go in there. But, you know, so for instance, TikTok, which I haven't really gotten into because I waste enough time on Facebook and Twitter already, you know, there's some classicists on there like Ellie Mack and Robert, for instance, uh, doing a lot of good work for the being a face of classics for, for younger generations who are, you know, more involved on those platforms. But I can't think of, you know, a good like space for scholars that, you know, would be an alternative to something like Twitter. There is LinkedIn and there's academia, but those are, you know, not as, the functionality is not really there for that. And the other problem with academia.edu is it's sort of, you know, it's, they try to, you know, get you to pay for them. And there's a lot of kind of problems with kind of supporting that site. Um, it's sort of a, a necessary evil for some people, but, you know, I don't, I don't fault people for using it. I'm on there. You know, it's, it's not something I would try to develop into kind of this space that we're pondering here. Yeah, well, you know, it goes without saying I hate paywalls. I just Mm -hmm. talk about accessibility issues. You know, it's just kind of a miserable experience. Oh, this person published a new article or journal or whatever. Oh, I can't read that. How how nice, you know, unless you have access to JSTOR. And even then, I have huge issues with JSTOR because you have to have Mm -hmm. like a university account or some kind of affiliation. And I'm like, well, what if I'm just that nerd who wants to go read a bunch of academic papers? They won't even let me do that. And so cutting off public access to really important works is its own issue that I, Mm -hmm. but I want to rewind a little bit. You're known online as the metal classicist. So I want to delve a little into how did you get into, I mean, have you always been into metal music and how did you find a way to parlay that into like your scholarly identity? So this this requires me to rewind, rewind back to high school and kind of revisit some of that because coincidentally enough, I got into classics and, and started taking Latin around the same time that I started getting into heavy metal music. Before that, I had basically been listening to the parent the, to the music my parents kind of raised me on, which was, you know, classical music, because uh, they're both musicians, uh, but also, you know, kind of the classic rock that uh, was on the radio in Boston, you know, during the 90s and, and stuff. It was around, yeah, freshman year of high school, I started getting into this kind of other kind of this kind of music through some of the more kind of the, the quote unquote gateway bands like Metallica and, and Rammstein and, you know, some of those new metal bands, uh, et cetera. It was sophomore year of high school. I was in a Latin class. I was taught by Abby Holt, who's on Twitter as a stick figure gods. Um, and she's an amazing Latin teacher. And she certainly was instrumental in, in my journey. Still does wonderful things. She now teaches at Audison Middle School. And I was uh, in that class with someone I became kind of friends with through kind of a mutual friend named uh, Nick Adams. 
and uh, he noticed that I was getting into this kind of music and he's like, hey, check out this band called Slayer. And we sort of became friends through this kind of shared interest in music and we're still good friends uh, and still see each other. He still lives in the Boston area. And he, he went on to the University of Toronto to study history and then got into academic publishing, which is, which is what he's up to now. We kind of went on this journey together into metal music at the same time we were taking Latin together. By the time we got to our senior year, we got into AP Latin 4, uh, taught by Dr. Smith, and we were reading Virgil's Aeneid, the far Aeneid, the, you know, the big purple thing, and we started noticing, you know, as we, especially when we got to like book two of the Aeneid with, you know, all of this, you know, carnage, you know, this giant serpent uh, coming out of nowhere and tearing apart Loacon, all of the just awful stuff that happened in the palace with Neapolinus and, and, and stuff like that. And we were like, gee, this sounds a lot like metal lyrics, like Virgil is, is writing heavy metal here. And, you know, at the time we weren't actually really aware that there were there was really any metal out there that dealt with ancient history topics or classical literature. And so we thought, you know what? This is a niche we need to fill. Eh? Nick was already learning to play guitar. So we decided, why don't we just form a two-man band right about Virgil's Aeneid. So it was not a very good band musically, but it was a kind of a fun little thing. Uh, and we wrote some songs, uh, you know, a song about Leoquan, you know, a song about Dido, a song about the descent into the underworld and books it. You know, I kind of did drum programming. I did vocal. We didn't really know what we were doing. You know, that sort of planted the seed of all these things. But interestingly enough, you know, despite us doing that, I never really thought of much about the crossover between heavy metal and just classical antiquity, just because I wasn't by looking because I just assumed there wasn't much there. So I sort of, you know, went through college and, and most of grad school, you know, listened to the bands I liked, uh, getting more into this stuff. And every once in a while, I came across some, some crossover. So for instance, uh, it turns out that before Nick and I had kind of formed this band, you know, around, you know, 2005, 2006, a band from Wichita called Manila Road, which is now one of my favorite bands. They recorded an album called Gates of Fire, which is sort of a kind of a, a trilogy. And two parts of those trilogies on that album is one is a trilogy about the Romans with a whole song about Aeneas and another on Romulus and Remus. And then there was another trilogy on the Battle of Thermopylae with the 300 Spartans. Okay. And so, so it was a great album. And it also turns out that it was really during this period of, of the 2000s and especially into the, the 2010s that a lot more metal music exploring classical literature, ancient history, not just Greek and Roman stuff, but you know, Egyptian history, uh, as well as uh, Mesopotamian stuff and beyond was more, and more, was more and more being written and was of interest to to bands that you know not we're we're not we're both taking this a lot from pop culture with you know because of the post gladiator phenomenon where you know we had that and we had 300 alexander uh and also you know kingdom of heaven um so there was a lot of medieval reception as well but also there were bands that were really kind of opening up their their history books and looking for more obscure topics to write about so you know i really like those bands it's like i want to find like a roman emperor nobody's talked about that's like totally badass and so there's songs on like maximinus thrax and decius and of course my kind of my main man is, is the emperor julian the apostate and there's some stuff out there on him but anyway it wasn't until i was about to defend my dissertation that it occurred to me that there's enough material out there that I could possibly make this a another kind of arm of my research. Okay, so my dissertation, I uh, I wrote it in, I finished it in the spring of 2018, and I was on the two deposit system, so I basically had to deposit the thing, wait a month for my committee to read it, and then and then defend the thing. During that month, I was in limbo. You know, I was like. I just spent the past two years just furiously working on this thing. And suddenly I stopped and you think that would be a welcome reprieve, but I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> I, uh, I was kind of like, you don't just go from 60 to zero. One of my professors said, Oh, you know what I did when I was in that situation? I just wrote an article on something completely different. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And so I wrote an article on the reception of the anti-Christian persecutions of Chris, uh, uh, under Roman emperors in metal, and there's quite a bit of material there. That ended up in the journal Metal Music Studies, and so that was sort of my entry into 
this topic. And then I continued to kind of explore this. I started a Facebook page called, it's now called Heavy Metal and the Ancient World, where I wrote kind of a lot of analyses of like lyrics and artwork and, and, and whatnot. And then I eventually joined Twitter and kind of brought that to bear there. But wonderful thing about this kind of area of reception is there are literally thousands of songs by hundreds of artists on every continent, except Antarctica, as far as I know, who have at least one song that mentions some topic from ancient literature, myth, or has artwork or stage performances that bring in stuff from antiquity. And because there's so much stu stuff out there, I really like it when other people kind of join in on the fun. Now, I was not the first to research this little niche area. People like Osman Umerhan at the University of New Mexico, Chris Fletcher at Louisiana State University, as well as people in Europe, such as uh, Helena Gonzalez uh, Vacariso in Spain and Christian Gerslev, uh, who's in Denmark. They wrote some stuff and they're continuing to work on it. And so those are those we've become this little community of metal classicists, if you will. I really uh, encourage more people to, to join in. So for instance, I have a conference that I'm co-organizing with Dr. Charlotte Naylor Davis uh, in the UK called uh, Heavy Metal and Global Pre-Modernity, uh, if you'll allow me to kind of plug this here. It's going to happen February uh, 24th through 26th next year. It's going to be an all online conference because as we were discussing, you know, really about this accessibility thing. Uh, and basically we want to invite people to, you know, if they have a research area in any area of the pre-modern world, anywhere in the world, and there's metal songs about it, present on something. Or if you're an artist, you know, if you're a musician who has written on this stuff, um, come and talk to us about kind of your your methods okay so we're hoping to have some fun with that and uh, again this is not something I want to keep to myself not at all yeah I personally am not a heavy metal listener I will admit right now but it does not shock me in any way that a lot of metal bands might take inspiration from the ancient world as a lot of artists do. I mean, there's a lot of other great non-metal music that, of course, they use references to the ancient world. It, it, it tickles me a little bit that I'm like, oh, there is a community for this, even in this little niche subject, because it'd be easy to wrap it all and just say, OK, I'm going to do classical reception in music, blank, big open space. But then to whittle that down and say, no, 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 I'm going to get really specific with it. I find it's really, really interesting and really, really cool because mm -hmm. there are not a lot of experts out there that I could point to and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, they know a lot about metal music. It's great. And ancient stuff. So props to you for finding and expanding on this niche area, which a lot of people still probably don't know exist. Do you also make a, an effort to also sort of peripherally pay attention to references to the ancient world in non-metal music? Absolutely. You know, I started doing this when I taught mythology course at the, at the Miami University. And I thought, I tend not to like push my metal stuff on students like maybe once one class I'll like you know for my Greek Civ class I'll play Iron Maiden's Alexander the Great so that we can critique the lyrics uh, after we just learned about Alexander so in my myth class I was like okay why don't we play Iron Maiden's Flight of Icarus okay uh, which is a very interesting take on the Icarus myth and uh, and I presented it alongside you know other kind of modern retellings of various myths this was the end of the semester so we you know read some Alicia Stallings poems and I also looked for other examples in other genres of music. So, uh, you know, for instance, I found the song Orestes by A Perfect Circle, which I thought was very interesting. They seemed to take to that well. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm hoping to have a panel accepted for the Classical Association of the Middle West and South Conference, CAMWIS, in which will happen in March of next year in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, the topic of that panel is ancient reception in modern and popular music. So I really want to definitely expand that conversation to, you know, not just metal, but also other genres of music, you know, K-pop, industrial, you know, rap, hip hop, pop, and, you know, also musicals as well. There's certainly, you know, things like Hades Town that I think, uh, and I just want to get all those people in the room, in a room together and uh, kind of have this kind of dialogue across you know, not just these musical genres, but also across various areas of expertise as well. So definitely. But again, I stay in my lane here and I'm definitely going to try to encourage people who are more into that kind of music to look into that because I think this is a great moment for this type of research to happen because we're finally getting to a point where classical reception studies 
is becoming more and more accepted as a legitimate and important area of classics. You know, in fact, I believe that it is just as important as, you know, philology and textual criticism, you know, all that kind of traditional, you know, Altertumswissenschaftlich type stuff, because, you know, this is how antiquity is meaningful to people who are alive, okay? who, to people who are not just studying it, but the people who are trying to live antiquity in various ways through arts, through the arts and also just their culture. You know, classical reception in, in cinema has certainly been a thing that's been well studied for a while and continues to be. Um, and so I just want to see music and more and, you know, not just, you know, classical and opera music where, you know, you tend to see those kind of studies, though that's also very interesting. You know, shout out to Robert Kedrer, one of my profs at, at Iowa for, the, for doing the opera stuff. This is something that I think is a very rich topic that breaking some ground on this. So again, if you're out there, there's some crossover between music you like and the stuff you study. Don't think of it as just some kind of frivolous exercise if you want to like do a bit more formal research on this because, you know, it, it should be done. Um, it's a great way to kind of make our field accessible to to the outside world is if we can talk about you know people like Taylor Swift and uh, and Kanye West and uh, and BTS and others uh, who are you know doing this in various ways. Yeah, and I'm so happy that you brought up the crossover with film and entertainment. And and I want to get there in a minute, but it just occurred to me and I think it would be just fun to to hear what is your if you have one absolute favorite metal song that involves the ancient world and do you have a favorite non-metal song about the ancient world yeah that is there is so much out there again there's thousands of songs a lot of them by artists that i really like that are my favorite artists to begin with the first thing that came to mind when you said that is what i'm going to go with i've mentioned this on other podcasts but i just love talking about it there is a greek epic heavy traditional heavy metal bands called Wrathblade. I forget how many years ago, um, not that long ago, they released an album called Wrath of the Deep Unleashed. Title to the album is in reference to a song on the album called Submersion. So the songs of Submersion by Wrathblade, which you can go listen to. I like it for numerous reasons, especially because, you know, the music itself is, you know, very epic and invigorating uh, and makes you want to sing along to the chorus uh, and the song, but also because it's about a very, very niche and very just a part of ancient history that is not really known that well unless you know you go and look for it and that was a natural disaster that uh, happened in the early to mid fourth century BCE. There was an earthquake which then caused a tsunami which submerged and destroyed a Greek city. Um, I think it was on the northern Peloponnese called Helike. And according to the ancient sources, I think it was this Pausanias, I think was the source for this, or, or Diodorus or, some, or one of those. Apparently, the story go went that uh, the citizens of Helike had offended Poseidon somehow, like they refused to install a, 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 sa a sacred statue of, of his there. I'm I forget the, the nitty gritty of that. Um, but basically, you know, you know, that sort of story came about. And so people just said, oh, they, they pissed off Poseidon. And so he, you know, did both the earthquake and the tsunami, wiped the city off the face of the earth. Anyway, so Rathblade chose to write a song about this called Submersion. And it's basically all about that. Chorus is just, you know, these, these kind of, these, these great kind of tenor vocals, behold Poseidon. And uh, you just got you just got to you just sing along to that. What's even better is the song corresponds not just to the album title but the album artwork, which uh, which you can look at. Um, and I think it demonstrates well kind of how heavy metal often receives ancient history because essentially what you see on the album cover is you see this ancient Greek looking town with temples and terracotta roofs and all that and everything's on fire and everything's kind of falling apart because it's an earthquake there's fissures in the earth and suddenly there's this giant tidal wave that is about to crash upon the whole town you know it's just chaos right and metal's all about chaos it's about you know kind of upsetting the status quo and what better way than through those kind of natural disasters and then the most the focal point of all this though is looming over this giant tidal wave is Poseidon himself he is absolutely jacked like Arnold Schwarzenegger early 80s jacked and he's just you know you know peak hyper masculinity like this is this is uh just 
yeah, it's it's really over the top, and that and again, metal is all about you know being over the top, excess in every possible way, to the point of kind of self parody, right? You know, it's sort of a little suck, tongue in cheek at times, um, but it's just you look at this Alan Marvel, and you're just like, holy moly, that's badass. So yeah, God of the Deep Unleashed by Wrath Blade. Just look it up. That would be my choice for a metal song. For non metal song, I could. I could say, you know, uh, Henry Purcell's Dido and Aeneas, the whole the whole opera. I wrote a paper on it in undergrad, and you know, I'm a big fan of Baroque music. But uh, in terms of like modern music, a song that's often in my head that I've been listening to lately is a song called "The Cult of Dionysus" by the Orion Experience. It's kind of a pop rock song. It's not really my style, but it's like because of the subject matter and because like the the refrain is really catchy and it's really kind of bouncy. It, it's it's a, it's a fun song about reimagining the cult of Dionysus, you know, in the modern day uh with regard to it's become really popular with the queer community, etc. You know, I have a I have a a colleague who is uh who's working on that. Yeah, it's just a fun song if you're if you if you're not into the, you know, the you know really uh hardcore heavy metal, you know, this is one you can listen to and it'll brighten your day. I had not heard of it, so I will go check it out. I will say right now that my freshman year of college, and I think it was like my very art history class, actually, I had a wonderful TA. And the first thing she did is she could tell we were all kind of like nervous and there's a bunch of freshmen. And so she was like, I'm going to I'm going to make it really comfortable in here. So she played put on a music video. And it just so happened that it was They Might Be Giants. And it was the Mesopotamians. And the minute it started playing, I was like, oh, I like her. I like, like this. I love this. And it sort of became the theme of, of any art history, anything I did. It was like the first song on my playlist that I would play right before studying homework or a paper or something. So I will say that is that is definitely my favorite. Check that out if you want to just have a really hilarious laugh. But yeah, all right. the, the day the day of uh, Roman Civ class when we you know get to the we talk about the Byzantine Empire toward the end, uh, you know I like to play the they might be giant song to uh, set the mood. <laughs> it's a good intro, right? It's kind yeah. of like that nice palate cleansy. It's like cheerful enough that you kind of just find yourself bouncing to it, and you're just like I don't really know what this is. Even if you have no idea who the ancient Mesopotamian kings are, I've still seen people, and I've I've done this experiment with friends and family who just have no notion of anything about the ancient world and they're singing along and they they can say these names and they they're kind of like hey this is this is pretty chill so i'm like yeah that's right it's the power of the ancient world just put it to some good tunes and then you'll be saying these names i'm pretty sure half my family had never said these names in their lives and they were like suddenly it's like they're all singing it and i'm like yes my job is done here ha 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 reception i wish i had a video of that it was a great moment it was a great moment I want to circle back now to the great point you brought up, which is this great crossover of entertainment and music and the ancient world and all that good stuff. First thing, I'm drawing way back at the beginning of our conversation. So you played a lot of computer games, video games. Uh, I believe you said it was what, Age of Empires? Yeah. Okay. Did you play the Civilization games? Interestingly, no. I uh, I didn't play a lot of computer games. Uh, you know, in addition to Age of Empires, I played uh, a lot of Sim City, which you know you know wasn't you know ancient world anything. It was just it was modern cities, and so I was kind of interested in kind of how the how to run a city. But I was also you know I was the kid who would build you know a bunch of things out of Legos and then immediately throw it into a wall or like besiege castles with golf balls. So you know I would create a Sim City and then you know turn on all the disaster modes and see it all crumpled down eh? because I think that was just sort of you could tell I was probably going to get into metal at some point because of that right chaos but I wasn't really into that many computer or video games actually like you know I played some Nintendo 64 games like Super Smash Brothers and some racing games but uh, you know I didn't really get into Civ or Rome Total War or or the Assassin's Creed game Assassin's Creed games uh, my partner uh, she's much more into that and so you know she really likes uh, you know playing those those games but I'm probably gonna like get her Assassin's Creed Odyssey just so I could watch while she plays uh, plenty of people doing great work on classics and video games that's 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 not my lane. <laughs> Well, highly recommended. You should, I would always say, purchase Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It is an amazing game and all the academics I know love it because they're just like, it's like being, it's like really being there. But the reason I brought that up is because I also grew up playing Sims. I, I wasn't that much of a fan of SimCity. I, I really glommed on to Sims 2. 
that that was really that was my shit right there and i know we're on to like sims 3 4 whatever we're on to now i never got into them so i still have my old sims 2 on my old like pc that i still pull out when i'm like all right i'm feeling polemic i'm going to play today i will admit i was that kid who like even though it's modern it's not ancient i named like all of my sims the gods names or whatever and i was just like okay so you know, how, how evil can I be today? And and so I think, you know, I like made a family where Hades was like the head of it. And then uh, I had a big party and then I like took the doors off of the, the, the house or, you know, the trapped them all in the pool or something. And then I killed them and I was like, well, that's Hades job. And then I was like, <laughs> wow, this is. When I played the Pokemon games on Game Boy, I would name my Pokemon after Greek gods. So my favorite Pokemon ever is Zapdos. And so I, uh, you know, I always would name it Zeus. Uh, and my Venusaur was Dionysus. And, uh, you know, my Charizard was Hephaestus. And my you know, Blastoise was was uh, Poseidon, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and then I had to get creative with like the other types. Like, hmm. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Oh, that's so funny. So I guess we're, we have similar interests. So your favorite Zapdos, mine was always Arctic kuno because i was just like in the mystique of he's so pretty and beautiful and whatever i can't believe some if do you know of anyone who's done like classical reception through pokemon or sims because i would love to see that i believe there's some people out there i know one person who did sort of like the archaeology of pokemon i i don't forget the, i kind of forget their name one of my best friends kenneth elliott just got his doctor at the university of iowa he has been doing a little bit with classical reception and the final fantasy games like specifically final fantasy 14 he has a he has a blog um where he's explored a few of these things which he might get back to now that he's you know defended and all of that shout out to him congrats uh, dr elliott okay so maybe someone will eventually go into mm -hmm. like straight up pokemon or something or sims I would love to see it if you're listening and you are thinking about doing something in classics or ancient studies and you love Sims and Pokemon, please do it. I will read your dissertation. I will come here. You speak at conferences. Dream goal. We're at an academic conference, like AIA lecture or something. And I just want every classes in the room to get up and all start seeing the, the main Pokemon theme <laughs> because we all love it and we're all it, nerds. It, in Latin, right? <laughs> in Latin or... So oh. can, can can someone do a, an ancient Greek version too, okay. so then we can yeah. have both? If you're out there, please do it. The, the reason I basically brought up all these video games was I grew up playing Civilization. That was my first real exposure to ancient sounding music. Civilization 4, which was all the rage when I was, what, 10 or whatever, when it came out. It was the first game to win a Grammy for its opening song, Baba Yetu which everyone is doing like a billion covers on online. I didn't know that until I started typing in Baba Yetu. And then I saw there were 10 million covers on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, okay, people love this. You know, it's not heavy metal music. It's just some sort of nice ambiotic. I, I think they brought in like a full choir or something to make the beautiful soundtrack. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. You should go listen to it if you have time. But do you see an avenue for putting metal music in more games or film and TV? Because I think right now when we see any of the popular movies and TV shows, if they are ancient themed, either they've got just some beautiful orchestral score that's all nice and pretty, or maybe people will use more modern music in a, but you never hear of metal music really in it. And I don't know, is that because they kind of assume people won't like it because it's a very specific type of interest or there are so many metal bands and whatever who are using ancient world references. I'm like, wouldn't that be kind of fun to put that into something to further sort of emphasize this connection to the ancient world? Yeah, I think we're slowly seeing more kind of heavy metal or heavy metal kind of inspired uh, soundtracks to video games and, and movies. Like I'm not a connoisseur of either things, uh, but I, I have definitely seen it in here and there. So for instance, uh, there's definitely some heavy metal-esque parts of the 300 soundtrack. However, whatever you think about that, you know, very problematic movie, um, it did kind of bring in electric guitars and power chords uh, into just a, you know, a movie score that is, you know, quite epic. Naturally, one of the most popular topics in heavy metal's reception of antiquity is the Battle of Thermopylae and the Spartans. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, writing a chapter for, uh, you know, for netted volume on that. Um, and so there's definitely a lot out there, a lot that's very problematic, you know, as well, you know, not every metal band uh, is writing about 
the ancient world with the best intentions, but that is a whole can of worms. Anyway, I've seen metal used in other movie soundtracks. So for instance, remember the movie Triple X with Ben Diesel? On that soundtrack is the Rammstein song uh, Feuer frei. Uh, and there's a music video for that, um, which is pretty cool, which has clips from the movie. Also, I think, uh, you know, when Iron Man came out, they used the the, the Black Sabbath song, Iron Man. Um, so it's it's working its way in, I think. And I'm sure there's there's plenty of films out there that use it a lot more. That, But again, you you know, it's in terms of like super popular Hollywood blockbusters, um, it's... Uh, it's still, it's, we're still getting there. You know, I think mu- metal music, you know, I think, you know, beyond like 19th century romantic music is, you know, some of the most epic stuff you can listen to, you know, especially since it, you know, not only does it create that kind of atmosphere uh, and kind of feelings of, of uplifting feelings of triumph and, you know, very intense emotions, but it's also, you know, a lot, of, there's a lot of metal out there that is compatible and, you know, combined with symphonic music. There's some bands that even work with full orchestras for live recordings, um, but also just have synthesized strings and horn and uh, horns and 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 woodwinds and whatnot, and or just have people on stage playing the flute, like a lot of folk metal bands using folk instruments uh, against sort of the metal kind of rhythm section and everything. Um, so you know, it's a very adaptable genre, and so definitely a place it should. It, it will probably be continuing to go. Now, this is just a fun one, but if one movie about the ancient world that you think would have really benefited from the inclusion of heavy metal music, which one would it be and why? I could think of scoring like the original, you know, early 80s Clash of the Titans with some like epic heavy metal, power metal from around that time, like, you know, bands like Manila Road or Omen or uh, Warlord, you know, there could be something there uh, that could work, you know, if somebody wants to, to try that. It's a hard one. I will say I love, I'm a sucker for beautiful, like orchestral things that are just so pretty. And like one movie I was watching the other day that didn't have like a traditional school, like composer, was the Alexander movie, because I know they popped the Alexander, like, final cut or whatever it's called on Netflix, and I I hadn't watched it in several years, so I was like, okay, I don't, I don't remember a lot, so I'll watch it. And it's definitely not, it's very unorthodox, and so I was kind of like, okay, well, it, it's nice what it currently has, it, it's fine. But I think t- they could have spiced it up a little more, almost, mm-hmm. so I don't know if, I don't know enough about heavy metal to be able to say this is it would have benefited and it would be great because I don't know what I would put or use but I just remember thinking to myself oh yeah you know it's fine could have done something different with it I think the thing with heavy metal is it's really meant to grab your attention it's like you know it's really in your face and intense and you know you can't score a whole movie with that kind of music which is why I think like their movies are better scored by you know perhaps other genres like you know, industrial um, or, you know, electronic. Uh, So for instance, you know, uh, I believe like Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor has scored films. And so there's a lot more range, dynamic range um, you can do with industrial music. And uh, I also think of like, you know, Tron Legacy with the the soundtrack Mm -hmm. by uh, Daft Punk, uh, I really enjoyed. That could be one reason why you're not just, you know, I think heavy metal is like fine for like parts of a movie, but if it's playing the entire movie, that's sort of laying it on too thick. And that's fine. I don't have to have metal take over every aspect of my life, despite the fact that I've let it take over my work and vice versa. <laughs> you know, when you're an academic, you have my work and then I have my play, but work and the play came together. And so we, I'll go to a metal show, I'm supposed to be there just having a good time. And suddenly I'm just, my academic brain is analyzing stuff. <laughs> like I'm suddenly a sociologist trying to understand people's behavior, these things, because uh, I'm reading a lot of that literature in, in, in heavy metal studies, which is the thing. And there's a lot of, there's a great community community of scholars all over working on that. I do like it when I can watch a movie and, you know, it's got a different soundtrack and remind me that there are other things in life. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned Trent Reznor, I was like, oh, well, because I I know that he collaborated with Atticus Finch and they did the music for The Social Network, which, funnily enough, interesting, interesting movie. I actually really did not like the score. I don't I don't know. I can't really pinpoint why I didn't. It was a little off kilter for me. Very unorthodox, I guess. Maybe it's just because I wasn't used to it. But that doesn't mean that his their other works are not amazing. I just, I remember thinking, you know, I just really don't like this score. It's really 
It's really strange to me. But you you have a point, though. I mean, using metal music or any music influenced by the ancient world and putting it into a medium like film, like TV, in in any medium that will get out to more people than strictly in the academic world is a great way to not only get it in there and use in it and keeping it alive, but also to help other people see these connections. And one thing that I really stress about and talk about all the time is making this connection of connecting the ancient world to modern, the modern world, the modern elements, and showing people that things are alive and well, and that they they matter. And one thing that I've been seeing is maybe we're not doing the greatest job of communicating that. I don't know what it is. But in this day and age, when everything is being defunded suddenly, We're talking about, you know, let's just cut this classics program. Let's cut that one because what they're doing is whatever. Like we we don't even care. Let's let's all pivot towards STEM, which, you know, it's important. Sure. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say we don't need STEM because we do, but we are just constantly devaluing what we do. And so if you were to go convince people at the government level, like, make an argument for why why should we fund you to study metal music i can think of 10 politicians off the top of my head would hear what you study what you specialize in what you spent years ostensibly trying to work toward and are still building a portfolio and just say no cut it don't want to do it yeah i mean there's (laughs) a lot there's a lot that could be said on that you know for for one thing, you know, the whole humanities versus STEM thing, I'm just like, we're not rivals. You know, we're only being made rivals for funding because there's scarcity created by, you know, the, the, the capitalist system that, you know, doesn't distribute resources, you know, in any sort of sustainable way for the benefit of society. But, you know, that's a whole other thing. With heavy metal, you know, this is, this is the fact that heavy metal is music that, you know, it's not just something that you know, teenagers in the, in the 80s get into in order to rebel from their parents, okay? There's people of all ages listening to it. Heavy metal has been around for over a half a century. It's one of the most popular genres of music in the world. There's fans and musicians on every, on, on every continent where, you know, it's not mostly penguins, but who knows what the penguins, you know, might be, might get into it. Anyway, so this is a phenomenon that needs to be Examine. We had the satanic panics from the 80s and the 90s where, you know, heavy metal got blamed for, you know, kind of social problems and, and school shootings and whatnot. But I think we're, we're past that in terms of sort of how mainstream society views this kind of music, though, of course, there will always be, you know, the more conservative elements who will you know not like anything that's different. And I think heavy metal can be really positive, you know, for social change because it is the the spirit of metal is kind of it identifies with the underdog it is always about kind of defying and questioning you know the established order you know thinking about alternative worlds confronting kind of the ugliness of human nature or history or society in all of its you know most graphic detail right you know the human condition and all of that and so the fact that people of all ages and genders and color, class, and creed, they are listening to this means that this is something that we shouldn't just not talk about because, you know, this is how a lot of people in throughout the world are making their lives meaningful. It is a, you know, it's a, it's a scene that they are belonging to. And it's a genre of music that is encountering and receiving and kind of interpreting the past and the present. And usually it's interpreting the past through the lens of the present. And I think that's something that should be discussed because it's a way of sort of showing that antiquity is being brought back to life in a certain way for audiences that may not encounter antiquity in many other ways besides perhaps, you know, cinema and maybe, you know, that one unit in in high school or whatever. Um, And so kind of this is where I kind of step in with along with my colleagues, you know, who study this stuff is I kind of help interpret those interpretations for the public. And this is why I, this is mainly what I do with my public scholarship is like, you know, here's how this band kind of talks about the Battle of Thermopylae and here's some kind of 
problems with representing it in this way, uh, but here's also some kind of new ways they do spin they have on it. And so let's kind of reflect on what the meaning of this battle has been in our culture uh, and our politics lately. And of course, there's a lot on that. But also I like to highlight, you know, how bands have kind of a new spin on antiquity. So, you know, I mentioned earlier kind of Iron Maiden's Alexander the Great, which was, you know, written, it's, you know, if you read, if you read it, clearly they're kind of nostalgic for the British Empire, it's kind of Tory-ish, looking at Alexander as sort of this, this icon to be admired. That was back in the 80s. And, you know, there's still a lot of music written on Alexander, you know, is very kind of pro-Alexander, you know, he is, you know, the, the force of civilization and masculinity and all of that, you know, and if you want to read about that, read Christian Dursleb's work on Alexander and metal. But there are also songs coming out, which take a more critical view of him. They really call him out as this sort of megalomaniac and imperialist colonizer, genocidal glory seeker. This isn't, a, you know, a model of a human being. This is, this is a cautionary tale. Hey, don't be like this guy because you know he's uh, done all these poor things, made all these bad decisions for himself and others. For instance, one song I like to highlight is the song "King of Kings" by a an American band called Iron Man, which has since dissolved because their you know their their main uh, guitarist uh, unfortunately passed away. So that's an example there. And so I'm trying to highlight how metal is you know not just recycling the tropes of antiquity, but also giving us new perspectives on it. Because the thing about reception is it's not just learning how an artist or work of art receives antiquity and interpret, interprets on its own terms, but it's also how, how can this art, how can this music give us a new way of looking back at antiquity? So it's, it goes both ways. Yeah, you just made a fantastic argument that I would hope that any person with funding, the power to influence that conversation would hear and say, oh, you're right. These actually offer really, you know, great insight to our, our own ourselves, our past, you know, who we are as as humans, part of the human experience and that this is valuable. But, you know, obviously it's how do you we always deal with the how do you assign some kind of value to humanity. I mean, we're always trying to find some sort of valuation, right? So, you know, if you cannot prove how valuable this is, then it shouldn't exist. It's such a terrible mindset, but yet we have to assign everything value. And I often think about that. It's quite vexing, right? I, I think my favorite example of that is money. Why do we go after the almighty green dollar bill in your hand? And it's like, well, it's just a piece of paper with no inherent value, but it has value because we assign it. So, so I'm kind of just like, why can't we make the humanities like money? Like both things that maybe wouldn't have, but then if we assign them value, oh, look, suddenly it's worth it. And then you're like, oh, the light bulb is on. I don't know if we're as a human population. I just don't, I don't know if we're introspective enough to, to see that the same way. I'm yeah. not holding my breath. <laughs> yeah, a great unexamined assumption is, you know, that something's value is, in fact, what uh, somebody or something's value is in, in a capitalist system, where is this something that will, you know, lead to the maximization of profit? A, um, so, you know, I, you've had, you've had discussions before about, you know, you know, do I go become an accountant or investment, you know, consultant or whatever, you know, because I'll make a lot of money uh, or do I, you know, pursue and, and again, people might be passionate about that and they should do it, but uh, you know, or should I go pursue, you know, something that may not be as profitable, but it will be fulfilling. And I think will help me make other people's lives fulfilling, even though, it is not as profitable to whatever, you know, to the powers that be. You're, again, that kind of perspective that it's all about that, that the monopoly money that we're playing with here. The humanities teach us that, you know, it's, we don't have to think of it that way. Okay? It is all just a game. That's eloquently put and very depressing to think about. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and something you said just, just a little while ago was, yeah, I, it's interesting how a lot of popular culture, including music, is a main driver of culture, of what happens. And then culture influences every other aspect of life, including political things. And so I think what's interesting is, yeah, the, music has the power to influence culture and then culture shifts and then culture drags politics and points of view along the way with it.
And it's really going to be interesting to see how, as we're getting more and more amazing artists discovered and people are creating, I mean, this is like the golden age of creation. I think, what was it? The popular saying is that Hollywood had its golden age and whatever year that was, I don't even know. But now we're in the age of streaming and individual content creators, which is awesome because anyone with access to basically a computer microphone can do whatever they want. So I'm trying to make this comparison and tie it together where Shelly, the inspiration for my podcast, I'm sure he's living in a very political time. He's in the, you know, he lived 1818, a very political time, very different political time. But here he is and he creates cultural things that are very much statements on the time he lived in. And so he was very much doing his own thing, kind of like we are now. And with that idea of culture being the main driver of human activity, I think this is a great chance to now see, okay, if he has the power to create something lasting that we still are reading and analyzing, and learning new lessons from, are we doing the same thing? You know, do you consider any of these artists right now creating things that are really going to have a lasting power to change and turn into like 200 years from now? Are we going to look at an artist, a band and be like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like this, we can point to this. And this is something that is going to live permanently in our cultural memory and be like, oh yeah, yeah. That was a main driver of, you know, what we were seeing at that point in time in the early 2020s. You know, what I think of is, you know, yeah, who today has, who has a segerunt uh, monumenta aere uh, perennia, right? Uh, according to Horace. Uh, and, you know, of course, at the time, who can tell? There isn't really anything that comes, that's come out recently where it was like Virgil's Aeneid, where it was like, this is an instant classic in their own lifetime, right? And it's going to be in the school curriculum and everything. But there's certainly plenty of, uh, for example, I think Toni Morrison, some of their, her books, you know, came out in her life and come standard, you know, reading in, in various curricula. But you know, in terms of music, time will tell. And the thing with Virgil and the thing with Shelley is often what determines what becomes those monumenta irae perennia is the institutions that decide their value. You know, with Virgil, you know, it was obviously it was, uh, you know, the Augustan regime that that propped it up. And then it was kind of the literati and the political elite at the time who determined that this was a classic, you know, for obviously for political reasons, but also just, you know, this became a standard part of Roman education. And they was put into the school curricula as well as, you know, the works of Livy as well. Um, and Cicero, certainly, you know, in the, in the declamation schools. And also with the works of Shelley to, and, of, uh, and of Mary Shelley as well, you know, there was uh, institutions in power that uh, decided that this thing written in the early 19th century was worthy of being read in schools and by and part of this kind of this tradition of great books. I hope that today that the institutions that decide these things are, you know, more representative of the diversity of artists that are creating this content. Because, you know, as we all know, you know, a lot of this so-called great literature and this canonization, you know, was canonized by uh, patriarchal elite institutions in, in the past couple centuries, you know, specifically European white males determining what is the classic or classical literature. The same thing's going to happen with, you know, metal bands and music of other genres is eventually some institutions can decide that, you know, say Iron Maiden and Metallica and others are going to be looked at the way that we look at the Beatles now or the Rolling Stones okay, in terms of the significant cultural change that they were a part of in the 1960s. You're right. The whole thing with influencers is, you know, it's not just the quality of the music is, you know, certainly part of it, but it's also you know, kind of the, the personality and kind of the views and character of the, of the artists is also, you know, really under scrutiny these days. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that'll go a long way as well. So for instance, you know, people were not just, uh, you know, into the Beatles because of their music, you know, they were into the, they were into it because, you know, the way they looked, the way they dressed and, you know, the kind of the outrageous opinions they had at the time that, you know, really caused a stir. And, you know, my mother, you know, grew up, you know, amidst Beatle mania. And so, you know, she, she, she lived through that. And so I feel like I'm sort of doing a similar thing with the music today. Time will tell. Yeah, well, you when when you said nothing stood out immediately and iconically like the Aeneid, 
you know, I would say yes, because I don't know enough. But at the same time, I just thought of Iron Man theme. Everyone knows the Iron Man theme. I mean, you play the first couple chords and people are just like, oh, that's Iron Man. And there's always popular references to it. They use it in a billion different contexts taken way out of context. It's lasting. And I think people 200 years from now, are you are they going to recognize Iron Man? I think yes. So it's interesting. I'm just seeing that parallel where I'm like, mm, you know, maybe, maybe Iron Man's like the kind of closest you can get to like immediate. Yeah, if any heavy metal survives 200 years from now, uh, I think Black Sabbath, you know, as as uh, founding fathers of heavy metal in many ways, you know, will will stand the test of time as they've done in the past 50 years, especially since, you know, there's just been so much literature written about them become it's again it's the classics there's a canon that was decided by various institutions metal has a canon okay so and just like homer and virgil we have black sabbath as you know sort of your starting point um and then all subsequent metal doesn't derive directly from it because there's other things like led zeppelin the purple blue chair and all the stuff and judas priest starting in the early 70s uh but you know they are without black sabbath you know it uh it would have been very different so yeah, that canonization definitely happens. That's a big part of it. Classicists, you know, uh, are expected to be familiar to some degree with kind of the traditional canon in sort of the discourse that we that we have. And so, you know, when you go to a metal show or if you're just hanging out with a bunch of metalheads, like usually we're pretty nice people. So if you don't, you know, know the canon, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll still welcome you. But there's also a lot of douchebags out there who are elitists and gatekeepers, but just same thing in classics. Um, but, you know, there are, you know, things that people are, expected to have be familiar with if you call yourself a metalhead you know like you know your your iron maidens your slayers your black sabbaths your motorheads you know etc and then depending on what kind of subgenres you're kind of branching out into then there's sort of the kind of the the mount rushmores of any particular subgenre to that you, you're supposed to hold in high regard well, it's, it, you know, it's a whole universe that I know exists. I should make more of an effort to, to get to know it. And, and I'm sure, like anything, since I'm very interested in interception studies, I'm sure I will start to really explore more when I can. And I hope other people do too, because it all sounds fascinating because I learned a lot just even, you know, talking with you today. Because I'm like, yeah, half the stuff I was like, yeah, I had no idea this was a thing. So I'm just, you know, hungry for that, for that information. You know, how much, how many more ways are we connected to the ancient world and through what mediums? You know, these are things that really interest me and I hope interest other people. But we've we've now mentioned Shelley and him sort of setting a precedent for beautiful poetry, for sonnets and all that. So now... At the end of the podcast, though, I want to get into Shelley himself, the man, the myth, the legend. If you would please read us his beautiful sonnet, Ozymandias, and then after reading it, just it doesn't have to be the most erudite, wonderful, long analysis you've ever given, but just your quick thoughts on, you know, what is the meaning of his poem? And, you know, like, how how do you receive this and, and what does it mean? I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk in a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozzy. Andius. King of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. I know a lot of people will kind of approach this poem and focus on kind of Osmandius himself and sort of his, uh, you know, the ephemerality of kind of human achievement. It's a desert. He did all these great things. I believe this is referencing, you know, Ramses II, you know, the historical Egyptian pharaoh, uh, and that just with the passage of time, it all sort of comes to naught. Okay? And what I'd like to kind of focus on with this and kind of what caught me with this is this poem is very much about poet and the power of poetry. Uh, and this is sort of what I connect to kind of the heavy metal reception of, of antiquity is, you know, songs like Iron Maiden's Alexander the Great, other songs like that are 
in the tradition of epic poetry and lyric poetry that is the kleos that heroes like Achilles and Odysseus and Ajax and others are striving for. They want to be immortal by being remembered forever. That is the, the truest form of immortality. And I really focus on this idea that, you know, how the poem starts. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, so Shelley is essentially saying, if it weren't for this chance encounter of somebody who was on site and noticed these little things poking above the sand, this king, this Ozymandias figure, nobody would have known about him. His immortality was so precarious that it depended on just someone coming across just a little bit of stonework in the sand and then told it to a guy who happened to be a poet who was later canonized as a great poet and therefore earned poetic immortality. So really the poets, the metal bands, the musicians, and however stories are retold of these ancient heroes and legends, that is the key here to this immortality as much as whatever deeds people like Ozymandias or Achilles achieved. Okay. Uh, and also the context here. Okay. So this is the early 19th century that this was written. This was before for the most part, the sands of Egypt were excavated to on to reveal this all this uh, what to reveal all we know about Egypt today. This was before the Rosetta, or maybe around the time. I don't I forget quite when the Rosetta Stone was translated uh, in order to kind of give us a lot more knowledge about ancient Egypt. But I'm assuming at the time that you know most people to most people the name Ozymandias or Ramses II was not a household name like Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, and so. Shelley here is kind of showing how, you know, it really depends on a poet to, to retell a story in order to grant and sustain that immortality that could so easily have been lost if it weren't for this chance encounter from someone who happened to see this inscription in the middle of the desert. That's kind of my thoughts on this. Yeah, I love it. And I think it speaks right to kind of what I usually take out of it, which is not only does it rely on people like Shelley and the power of artwork and bringing that to, to public consciousness again, but even at the time when the ostensible statue was created, it's the little guy, right? Like Ramses, he's not going to build that statue himself. So you'd forget right about him. I mean, he didn't ask politely, can you please build me my statue? No, I mean, he was probably ordering slaves around like, yo, build me my statue because I'm great. But same sort of thing applies, which is you have to rely on somebody, a small guy, to achieve ostensibly what you want. Yeah, it's like it's like a billionaire blasting himself into space and uh, saying something like, behold, or look on my works, ye mighty, and despair, as if they're, in this case, his works, and not built on the backs of tens or hundreds of thousands of people who have made that journey into space possible. So this is, that's definitely a very important thing. So yeah, it's not just the poet, it's not just the traveler, but it is also, of course, as you mentioned, the, the epigrapher. So these three people who are just unnamed in this poem, and Ozymandias's reputation is entirely dependent upon that. Yeah, kind of thinking about that then and this this almost transactionality of uh, you do this for me and I get remembered. Ha ha ha, maybe you'll get remembered because you built me a thing, whatever that looked like back then, whatever. But thinking about it that way, the, the last question I love to ask every single guest on the podcast is if we consider our society today, is there a modern Ozymandias, something that we think is amazing, the best ever, it'll last forever now, that realistically 200 years from now a thousand years from now we're gonna look back and be like what the hell was that this is just terrible before i get to that just one more thing on this uh epigraphy thing because mm -hmm. uh i believe don't know if this is apocryphal the architect of the lighthouse of alexandria okay i unfortunately i don't remember his name because that would have been important here who well, i believe built it for Ptolemy the second or something like that he built an inscription over the entrance to the lighthouse you know saying you know blah 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 Ptolemy the you know King Ptolemy blah blah but he created the inscription in such a way that the Ptolemy part of the inscription was made of kind of a flimsy material that crumbled and eroded away rather quickly and revealed underneath it the inscription with his own name 
So that's just what came to mind. And I, uh, and I just love that story, you know, of kind of the unsung hero kind of getting their last laugh. But in terms of like a modern Ozymandias, I can't really identify any people, but one thing that comes to mind is the city of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Now, I don't know too much about this whole subject, but, you know, if you look at maps or just aerial photos of Dubai from, a, you know, just half a century ago, it's this little tiny town on, on, the, on the Persian Gulf. And now look at it now. It's a bustling metropolis with all these skyscrapers, including like the tallest skyscraper in the world by far right now, and all these other just really impressive buildings. And as far as I know, the UAE and Dubai, all of that was built on the oil industry because they had a lot of oil there that they sold okay, and continue to sell to sustain that business and create that great city. Well, eventually we're gonna run out of that oil. And it could be the case that these great skyscrapers will be abandoned one day because just the money's not there anymore. And perhaps, you know, the city of Dubai will return to, will just be abandoned and it will just be this kind of ruins of Valeria or whatever that is looked upon, similar to the monument to Ozymandias. I think about what happens, you know, when you play Sim City and the economy tanks and all the buildings revert to like abandoned mode and it's all, all of that. So, uh, you know, it could be the case that Dubai, you know, reinvents itself and invests in, in you know, other things. Uh, and they might be doing that. They're probably thinking about that. But, you know, that's just what came to mind with in terms of like you know eventually you know fossil fuels will not be a profitable thing anymore and obviously there's other reasons to abandon it you know like you know the fate of humanity depending on it but uh, could be that's a great one and that's a new one that i have not heard oh i love new answers yeah that is i had not thought about because i don't honestly know much about dubai and i was like yeah i mean i think they have the tallest building in the world and i was like i don't really know what else they have but yeah. Wow. 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 It'll be interesting to see. Well, obviously we'll be dead, but like 300 years from now, Dubai, you okay? You, you still there? You, no? Yeah. Maybe. So that is an excellent answer. And I want to leave it there for other people to sort of decide for themselves whether or not they think Dubai will still be around or gone or transformed. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's been such a pleasure to learn so much more about the, the heavy metal scene and, and how it intersects with classics and popular entertainment in the world at large. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. This is a great conversation. I'm glad that, you know, we we're able to cover topics more than just the niche stuff I'm into, uh, because, you know, I like trying to branch out and, and make those connections. And, you know, these kind of conversations allow me to do that. So I appreciate it. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings.